given the Smarter Solutions for Students Act and yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're here today to address a crisis of Washington's own making. Several years ago, Congress decided politicians, not the free market, were better equipped to set student loan interest rates. Politicians set a fixed rate of 6.8 percent for all loans and then decided to advance legislation based on a campaign promise that would temporarily phase this rate for subsidized Stafford loans down to 3.4 percent. Last summer, with the expiration of the lower rate schedule for July 1, 2012, debate about student loans reached a fever pitch. The president began touring college campuses, calling on Congress to prevent the increase that his own party set in motion back in 2007. As I said at the time, no one wanted to see interest rates double, particularly at a time when one out of every two college graduates was struggling to find a full-time job. But we need to move away from a system that allows Washington politicians to use student loan interest rates as bargaining chips, creating uncertainty and confusion for borrowers. When Congress approved legislation to temporarily stave off the Stafford loan interest rate increase, my colleagues and I lent our support with the promise that we would use this time to work toward a long-term solution that better aligns interest rates with the free market. The Smarter Solutions for Students Act accomplishes this goal by simply moving all federal student loans, except Perkins loans, to a market-based interest rate system. This responsible legislation builds upon a proposal that was actually put forth by the President earlier this year. The Smarter Solutions for Students Act is a narrow piece of legislation that will provide a lasting solution to the problem facing the federal student loan program. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, some critics would rather kick the can down the road and simply extend the current arbitrary rates at a taxpayer cost of roughly $8 billion. They want to continue the failed status quo and leave politicians in charge of setting rates. Earlier this week, the Washington Post called it a, quote, weird fact, unquote, that student loan interest rates, quote, aren't pegged to anything real, just to the whims of Congress, which inevitably uses student loans as political playthings, close quote. Students deserve better. They shouldn't have to watch as Washington holds their interest rates hostage each election year. They shouldn't have to deal with the uncertainty that comes with waiting for politicians to cobble together another temporary fix to keep interest rates in line with the market. We have an opportunity today to get politicians out of the business of setting student loan interest rates. We have an opportunity to provide students with more stability in the long run by putting an end to quick fixes and campaign promises, and we have an opportunity to build upon common ground with the administration to advance a bipartisan solution that's a win for both students and taxpayers. I urge my colleagues to support the Smarter, students, Smarter Solutions for Students Act, and I reserve the balance of my time. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, in little, little more than a month, the interest rates on loans to millions of the neediest students will double from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent. With that doubling, those who can afford at least will be burdened with more debt. With total student loan debt already surpassing a trillion dollars, this Congress stops, needs to stop that interest rate hike, that doubling of the interest rates. But rather than make it more affordable for students and families to pay for college, this Congress, this day, in this chamber, is debating a bill, I know people won't believe this, but we're debating a bill to make it more expensive for families and students to achieve a college education. At a time when college costs are rising and historic low interest rates, the majority is asking us to accept a bill that would increase interest rates. And even though the student interest rate is, is scheduled on July 1st, to double from 3.4 to 6.8, the bill presented on this floor today is worse than that for students and their families. It increases the drag on the economy that the student debt is to families and to young people trying to seek a job and to seek to form a family. This bill is so bad, this bill is so bad that 
it means more than the doubling of the interest rates. How do you think that that has anything to do with the market rates? According to the Congressional Research Service, when they look at this bill, you can see that under, under current law, they would, uh, interest rates, they'd pay 4000 Under the, uh, uh, under doubling to 6.8, they would pay $8,800 in interest rates. And under the Republican bill, families would pay more than $10,000 in interest rates. How can that possibly be in the interest of these families? How can that possibly be happening in this economy when people are struggling with this interest rate? It, it cannot be allowed. And you can see here that the parents who may have to contribute something and then would take out a loan to help their child complete a college education, they're going to pay more than $35,000 over the life of those loans than under the, than, than under the, the current law. If, if, and that's what we've got to stop from happening. And so what you see is, is that when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, this bill asks students over the next few years to pay more than $3.7 billion, almost $4 billion in increased interest rates. No wonder this poor student has a headache. No wonder this parent's pounding on their head thinking, what am I going to do with this? What am I going to do? But what do they say? They say we have a market rate here. We have a market rate. Well, many in America, certainly middle class families and many low income families will remember the last time we had this kind of market rate. Because what they have is they have a teaser rate for your first year. They'll have a lower interest rate. So you have a teaser rate. But you know that, that next year that teaser rate adjusts. So you don't get that rate because next year you get a new rate. And when, the, when you're a sophomore in college and you take out another loan, you get a new rate, a higher rate. And when you're a junior, you take out a loan, you get a higher rate. And when you graduate, they take all your loans together and give you a higher rate. Does that sound familiar to people? That's the marketplace. That's the marketplace when you choose to crush the people who are borrowing the money. The president has a market rate. The chairman has said many times the president has, is looking to the, using the markets to set a realistic rate. But anyway, as he sets the rate, it's, it's deficit neutral. As he sets the rate, the amendment we tried to offer was deficit neutral. He saves those students and families about $30 billion over the life of those loans. You get the difference? Yes, the market's the market. But you can pick the worst of the market, you can pick the best of the market. They've chosen to pick the worst of the market for these students. Now, they had options. Republicans last night in Rules Committee had options. Mr. Courtney offered an amendment. To keep rates at 3.4 percent, they rejected it. I offered the president's market approach. They rejected that. Then Mr. Heck, from the, from the Republican side of the aisle, from Nevada, offered to say, let's provide an incentive to make sure that students, in fact, continue to pay on time as they should, as the market would do, because you want to incent, incent good behavior, because you get more of it. They, re, they rejected that. Mr. Rice from South Carolina went before them as a member of the Republican caucus very concerned about the interest rates in this legislation, very concerned about what's going to happen to these families. He thought he could lower the interest rates within their bill, within the market rates, stick with the market principles. They said no. So all you get today is whether or not you want a solution that is worse than the doubling of the interest rates on July 1st. That's not an answer for America's families. That's not an answer for America's students. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm now pleased to yield to the Vice Chairman of the Education and the Workforce Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Petri, two minutes. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized for two minutes. I rise today to support H.R. 1911 because it would put in place a long-term market-based solution to federal student loan interest rates. Some on the other side wish to engage in endless debates on the level of student loan interest rates. This is the wrong debate to be having, however, and distracts us from real reform. By taking this issue out of the hands of politicians, H.R. 1911 moves the discussion forward. I believe there are better ways to help students manage the repayment of their loans than ever higher interest rate subsidies. Income-based repayment, an idea that originated with Milton Friedman and was subsequently advocated by Presidents Reagan, Clinton, and Obama, is better for students and taxpayers. Well, we have an income-based repayment option now, it doesn't do enough to protect students or taxpayers. Therefore, working with Representative Jared Polis, I've introduced legislation to make needed reforms. 
With today's bill, we can break free from this debate over interest rates and focus on real reform to help students struggling with student loan debt. So I'd urge passage of H.R. 1911 and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. I yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hinojosa. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 1911, the Republican bill to make college more expensive. In America, we often speak of the importance of expanding educational opportunity and supporting students in achieving the American dream. Unfortunately, our student loan debt crisis is crushing the dreams and aspirations of students and college graduates. As Congressman Miller said earlier, today student loan debt exceeds $1.1 trillion. According to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, student loan debt surpassed total outstanding credit card debt for the first time in 2010. These staggering figures are truly unacceptable and must serve as a wake-up call for developing a long-term solution that helps, not harms, current and future borrowers. As a result, it is shocking that the majority party would bring a bait-and-switch scheme to the House floor, a bill that would force students into loans with skyrocketing interest rates. I find it shameful that H.R. 1911 would reduce the federal deficit on the backs of students and parents by saddling them with almost $4 billion in additional loan interest charges and leave students worse off than than if Congress simply allowed student loan interest rates to double on July the 1st. High levels of student loan debt can limit where college graduates live and work. It can affect the kinds of careers that students can uh, follow. High levels of debt can create obstacles for young people who hope to start a family, to purchase a home, and save for retirement. To be clear, students and families deserve more from U.S. Congress, not less. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, I need 10 seconds. Additional 10 seconds. Gentlemen's recognized for additional 15 seconds. Thank you. For these reasons, I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to oppose H.R. 1911. I suggest you do two things. One is work to prevent interest rates from doubling on July the 1st, and second, work to make college more affordable and accessible through the reauthorization of Higher Education Act. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to yield two minutes now to the chairman of the HELP subcommittee, the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Rowe. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. I thank the chairman and thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the Smarter Solutions uh, for Students Act. Um, this is a student loan debt, as I agree with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, is a huge issue in this country. And how do we get to the current rate of 6.8 percent, I asked myself. And I went back and reviewed it, and in 2006, the Congress uh, decided that the interest rates were too high, so they wanted to lower the interest rates, but found out they couldn't afford the cost of it. So gradually, stepwise, it went down last year. In one year, we had a 3.4 percent in, uh, student loan rate tied to nothing but other than the whims of Congress. It created a fiscal cliff for loan rates, so we voted to extend it for one year to give us time to have a permanent solution for this. The permanent solution that we're offering is to simply treat a student loan like any other loan and tie it to a Treasury note plus 2.5 percent for a Stafford loan. Now, what does that mean? And uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, very eloquently, uh, Mr. Miller spoke just a moment ago about how rates can go. Variable means rates can change. That's absolutely true. But rates can also go down. It doesn't necessarily mean that rates will go up. And, and in, in acknowledging this, an 8.5 percent cap was put on those loans. And I checked the student loan rate if you went to your local bank or uh, credit union to see what a loan rate would be, and it's about 7 percent now, higher than that. And I agree with my good friend Ruben Hinojosa, who believes that we should work for ways to help uh, make college more affordable. I could not agree more. 
the Secretary of Education just this past Wednesday said he agreed and supported a permanent solution. The President said he supported market-based approach. This will give certainty to it, and certainly I would urge my colleagues to vote and support this very needed piece of legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. You two, two minutes to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my friend for yielding. The question before the House this morning is whether we should make college more affordable or less affordable. Which is better for the country? If we do nothing by July 1st, interest rates double on student loan rates from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. This bill makes it worse. It will actually increase the college uh, cost for a typical student by five or six thousand dollars over a ten year period. Three point seven billion dollars across the country. There's a better way. The better way, the government's borrowing money today at one percent. Why don't we borrow the money at one percent, factor in the cost of administering the loans and setting aside a, a reserve for default, and charge that amount to the students? rather than run a profit-making enterprise on student loans. Mr. Tierney uh, and others have taken the lead on this. Mr. Courtney has. And that's the bill that I think is the appropriate long-term solution. But I do know this. If you listen to any corporate leader, any business leader in America, they tell you this. We will only grow and prosper with a skilled workforce. And we will only have a skilled workforce if higher education is affordable. The simple question before the House, is if you think higher education should be less affordable, vote yes. If you think it should be more affordable, vote no. No is the right vote. There's a better way. We should put that on the floor and proceed that way. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I now yield two minutes to a member of the committee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Well, I thank the chairman for yielding. You know, absent congressional action, interest rates on student loans will double from 3.4 to 6.8 percent on July 1st. It's not that far away. We need both parties and both chambers working on solutions now. <coughs> we can't afford more last-minute backroom deals and political brinksmanship. The Smarter Solutions for Students Act is a common-sense approach. This bill prevents the rate hike from happening and ends what has become an annual debate within Congress on how to set the rates for student loans. This bill puts in place a rate that is more predictable and affordable. It builds on a proposal put forward by President Obama in his fiscal year 2014 budget request. Now, both these proposals move to a market-based interest rate, not one set by politicians in Washington. Now, we have a responsibility to America's youth to put forward a long-term plan for college affordability. This bill is a good first step and will offer students the lowest possible rates for higher education by ensuring the solvency of these important loan programs. And I encourage my colleagues to join in the support of this bill. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. I yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. The gentleman member from of the Virginia community. is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise in opposition to the Making College More Expensive Act. In 2007, Congress cut the interest rate on student loans in half from 6.8 percent to 3.4 percent for five years. Last year, we extended that benefit for one more year. In a few weeks, on January or July 1st, if Congress chooses not to act, the interest rate is scheduled to double back to the rate of 6.8 percent. Incredibly, this bill is so bad that, according to the Congressional Research Service, students will actually be better off if Congress were to let the rate double to 6.8 percent than to adopt this legislation. This bill is also bad because it makes rates variable for the life of the loan, therefore forcing students to sign for an interest rate that will fluctuate over time so they don't even know what it's going to be from one time to the next. This proposal essentially asks students to sign up for a loan without knowing what they're signing up for. Now, this is different from the Democratic proposals on various on variable interest rates. 
because the President's proposal and the Democratic alternative that was offered in, the, in, in, in committee has a variable rate, but once you sign the loan, that rate is fixed for the duration. So you know what you've signed up for, and with the historic rates now, you can sign up for a loan rate that's probably much lower than any of the numbers that, are, that were being considered. But this rate, this rate is so bad that when Congressional Research Service estimates that we return to normal rates, that the student will actually be worse off than if we just let the rates double to 6.8 percent. So I urge my colleagues to work diligently to improve access to quality education by making higher education more affordable and ensuring that the interest loan rates are reasonable, and that starts with defeating this bill. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I now yield uh, two minutes to the uh, Chairman of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. I thank the Chairman. Mr. Speaker, uh, recently I had the opportunity to meet with more than a dozen of Michigan's private colleges and universities. Uh, they're working hard, as you might guess, to address the rising costs of college education with their institutions and other institutions, with students who desire an education. At the same time, this House, under the direction of this committee, is working hard to address student loan interest rates in a way that brings long-term stability to the program. The interest rate for federally subsidized Stafford loans is currently set to rise at to 6.8% to on July 1, 2013, matching it to the current unsubsidized Stafford loan rate. Other federal loans have rates as high as 7.9%. Any further temporary extension of the current rate only kicks the can down the road. We've done this already. Politicians versus markets. Markets will always produce better long-term results, and only those who refuse to deal with the truth of history and reality would say otherwise. Congress has a unique opportunity to institute long-term bipartisan reforms. Why not? We know in our hearts it's the right thing to do. Both President Obama and the House have favored market-based solutions to current rates. The Secretary of Education desires a long-term solution like this as well. Instead of a long, another short-term fix, the Smarter Solutions for Students Act provides a long-term solution to the student loan interest rate problem. It returns all federal student loans, except Perkins loans, to a market-based interest rate and takes politics out of this part of our children's education. The only way this plan won't work is if the liberal, progressive, central planners that control our government policy now are allowed to continue their failed approach and it is a failed approach. Pass this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. I, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for two minutes. So I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I draw the point that was mentioned earlier that the Democrats made a promise to keep these loans at 3.4 percent, and the promise is being broken. It's being broken by this bill, this proposal by the Republican Party. We kept our promise through the entire reauthorization of the Higher Education Opportunity Act and two more years in addition. This is the proposal now. We say stay at 3.4 percent. Republicans say no, jack it up more than double on that basis. I join with millions of students and parents and organizations that represent them in strong opposition to this Making College More Expensive Act that's before us here today. You know, my Republican friends talk about how this bill is simple and predictable. It's predictable, all right. I predict that the rates are going to go right up beyond the 6.8 percent rate. We've already seen that from the Congressional Research Service, a nonpartisan group that says if we pass this Republican bill, those rates will go up more than double on that basis. And it is not simple. They would have you believe through this debate that the rates are going to go down to market rates, which at the current time are lower. Well, they would if you followed our bill at 3.4 percent, but if you went with this bill of Making College More Expensive Act, it sets it low for the first year, but it rewrites the second year, and it resets the third year, and it resets the fourth year. So at the end of four years, you get the whole package with the higher rate, and that is going to be almost $4 billion more in cost for these students and parents than it is for people right now. The Congressional Budget Office said these interest rates would be almost $4 billion. We know that to be the case. These are the same people that tell us they don't want to burden our next generation with the debt 
but they apparently have no problem at all burdening the next generation by burying them in student loan debt year after year after year. Look, I have a hearing from people all over my district. And in fact, one woman from Wilmington wrote me and said that when her son graduates from college, his loans will equal what her husband and she paid for their first home. With the interest rates he'll pay, it'll be even more. Something is not right with the system, she says. Both college tuition costs and student loan interest rates are wrong. She's right. This bill is wrong. Let's do the right thing. 3.4 percent now in the interim. Do a Higher Education Reauthorization Act that takes care of this problem Gentleman's going forward. Expired. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time still expired. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in order to balance the uh, the speakers, I'll reserve. Gentleman from Minnesota reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. I, knew, I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. McCarthy, member of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that. Minute. Mr. Speaker, I stand today against making college more expensive act, and let me tell you why. I represent a pretty large minority area, and over the last several years, we've he seen those scores in those students going up and up, and for the first time, we're seeing a higher rate of young people going to college. This is not the time to be looking at making college more expensive. Their loans, first-time generations of uh, students going to college. This is wrong. This is supposed to be a friendly family bill. For who? It's certainly not for my constituents. You know, I'm sorry also to say that what we're going to be seeing is after this bill, and it will probably pass today, it dies. The Senate is not going to pick this up. So again, we have wasted all our time instead of working together to come to a solution. And again, as you heard, according to the CBO, if Congress, Congress did nothing and let student loan rates double on July 1st, students would be better off. General this is not expired. a good bill. I ask my colleagues to vote against General it. General time has expired. I'll continue to reserve. General reserves, gentleman from California. I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Davis, a member of the committee. Gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, student interest rates are set to double in a little over a month unless Congress stops it. And that's why I rise today in opposition to the Making College More Expensive Act. We should be considering legislation like the one my colleague, Mr. Courtney, introduced to extend low interest rates for two years. But instead, we're debating a bill that makes students worse off worse off than if Congress does nothing. That's because under this bill, student interest rates would be subject to the whims of the market. Today, interest rates are at an all-time low, but what about five years? What about 10 years? What about 15 years from now? This bill lures students in with a low variable rate, only to trap them with a higher rate upon repayment. Well, Mr. Speaker, we've seen this bait and switch before, only usually it was by credit card companies setting shop outside of college sporting events, not by the federal government. We are not subprime lenders. The federal government should not be profiting from students. It shouldn't be making $4 billion Delay's time has off expired. Of For what I yield back. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now yield one minute to a member of the committee, the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 1911. This common sense bill, aptly named the Smarter Solution for Students Act, brings the student loan interest rate program back to reality. Instead of coming back each year to partake in the Washington tradition of putting last year's failures off to the next year, this bill gives students and their families the certainty that their loan rates won't be subjected to the whims of bureaucrats in Washington or legislators on Capitol Hill. This legislation ties student loan interest rates to the 10-year Treasury note. In fact, the President's fiscal year 2014 budget request included language very similar to this bill. H.R. 1911 goes even further towards protecting students and families from high interest rate environments by including caps on interest rates. I encourage my colleagues to support this bill, and I thank Chairman Klein and Virginia Fox and their staffs for their hard work in bringing this common sense legislation to the floor. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Uh, can I inquire of the chair of the time on both sides? Gentleman from California has 15 minutes remaining. Gentleman from Minnesota has 20 minutes remaining. 
I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, a member of the committee. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is amazing. At a time when we know that student loan debt now has skyrocketed above all other forms of consumer debt, credit card debt, uh, car loan debt, uh, and students are now graduating on average with over $25,000 of student loan debt, a ticking clock 38 days away where the r rates are going to double. The bill that the majority has come forward with makes the problem worse, not better. Uh, again, the, the analysis from independent sources, the ones that we rely on to make decisions in this body, the Congressional Budget Office and the Congressional Research Office, make it clear that if we do nothing, the interest cost for the average Stafford loan will, will add $4,000 in interest payments. If we pass this bill, the interest will, will rise by $5,000. So the notion that this is somehow a solution to the problem, the misnomer that this bill is, is given, the reverse is true. Mr. Speaker, we know that the Senate is not going to move over the next 38 days. They're doing the farm bill. They're doing immigration reform. It is time to protect students by extending the 3.4 percent rate, a rate which I hasten to add was passed in 2007 with a large bipartisan majority signed into law by George Bush, was extended again last year with large bipartisan majorities signed by President Obama. Let's do a two-year extension and then let's get to work with a five-year Higher Education Reauthorization Act. The problem of higher ed is not about Stafford loans only. It's about Pell Grants. It's about Perkin loans. It's about students not being given good information in high school. It's about allowing graduates to refinance their debt, which they are now uh, confronted with large barriers. That's the real work to solve the higher education challenge and issue in this country. In the meantime, let's extend the two-year rates. And Mr. Speaker, I have letters from 21 campus-based organizations representing real live college students all across America who, who support the democratic measure to extend those rates, get a good higher education authorization bill, and totally, totally reject the measure that's on the floor today, the, the Make College More Expensive Act. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. The speaker, gentleman, I'll reserve. gentleman from Minnesota Reserve. Gentleman from California. I yield one and a half minutes to the gentlewoman from Oregon, Mr. Bonamici. Member of the committee. Gentlelady is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to the Making College More Expensive Act, a bill that will potentially make college more expensive for thousands of students and families across the country. Across America, students and graduates are trapped under a trillion dollar mountain of student loan debt. And with this bill, the problem's about to get worse. On July 1st, interest rates will double for millions of students entering college. But this bill is not a constructive solution. In fact, this bill will make the problem worse. Rates are currently 3.4% and they will double to 6.8% if we do nothing. But under this bill, the rates will be uncertain because they'll be variable and will be as high as 8.5%. According to the Congressional Budget Office, this legislation will force students to pay thousands more in interest than if Congress simply does nothing and lets the rates double. It's just not fair. On average, middle-class families haven't seen a raise in years. Many are working harder for less money. They're struggling to buy everything from groceries to gas. They're relying more on the federal student loan programs to finance the growing cost of college. But instead of debating how much we should lower rates, instead of considering comprehensive reforms to address college costs, we're actually considering legislation that would be worse if we did nothing at all. Mr. Speaker, this is unproductive, unreasonable, and unacceptable. I urge my colleagues to vote no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Now I'd like to yield uh, three minutes to another member of the committee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Messer. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Chairman Klein for his hard work on this bill. I'd also like to thank the subcommittee chair, uh, Fox, for her hard work. I, I rise today in support of H.R. 1911, the Smarter Solutions for Students Act. This debate is about a fundamental question. Who do you trust more, the promises of big government or the private market setting rates in the marketplace? I believe we must return to a market-based policy rather than keeping Congress in the business of fixing interest rates by throwing darts at a dartboard. We make two simple points to this chamber. First, markets work. 
The President has recognized this. Chairman or Education Secretary uh, Duncan has recognized this. They both have called for a market-based uh, return to market-based rates and policies on our student loan interests. Um, families deserve the security of knowing that the marketplace will be setting their interest rate, not the results of the next mud wrestling match in Congress. I've heard a lot of rhetoric on the other side of the aisle about how rates will will rise if, if we change this policy. Lost in that rhetoric is the fact that over the course of the last decade, there have been times where interest rates would have been much lower had we had a market-based approach to interest rates. Um, in the 2002 student groups lobbied Congress to set student loan interest rates at a fixed 6.8 percent beginning in the 2006 academic year. At that time, rates on student loans were variable and at historically low levels. However, student groups believed that a 6.8 rate would result in a better deal. Turned out they were wrong. Uh, through that period, interest rates, had we stayed at the variable rate, would have been 2.36 percent. I don't think it's fair to those families that accumulated loans during those times that we had the government in the way. The second point I think that needs to be made in this debate is that while uh, we need to have low uh, interest rates for students, and, and we're all concerned to want to make sure they, they don't rise, the real threat to young people in this country is not a few dollars on their interest loans. Another minute. The real threat is the explosive growth of debt in this country. The fact that we are adding a trillion dollars of debt each year, $6,800 of debt per taxpayer each year, and it's dragging down our economy and hurting our ability to create jobs. Let's return to common sense policy on interest rates. I urge my colleagues to support 1911. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Indiana yields back. Gentleman from California. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Welsh. The gentleman from Vermont is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to the Making College More Expensive Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is just not right. We're borrowing, the federal government is borrowing money at 1.8%. Uh, then we're lending it now at 3.4%. If we do nothing, it goes to 6.8%. And under this bill, it probably will hit up around 10 percent. We're ripping off kids. I mean, we're making money off of these kids. And a confident nation will invest in the dreams of our young people. It won't crush those dreams. And why are we doing it? You know what? We're borrowing money as a government at 1.8 percent. The Federal Reserve is lending money to the big money center banks at 0.75 percent but we're going to be charging up to 8 or 10 percent to our kids? I don't, I don't get that. Families are sitting around the kitchen table having discussions if they have three kids, which two can we send to college? Parents who thought they had equity in their home and were going to be able, after working 30 years... I yield the gentleman an additional 30 seconds. Who are going to be able to, additional 30 seconds. Who, who, after 30 years of work, are going to be able to finally take that cruise, that vacation, they're refinancing their home to help their kids. And despite that, which compromises their retirement, their kids are getting out of college in Vermont with an average debt in the range of close to $30,000. It's tough on the kids, it's tough on the parents, and it's bad for our economy, and it's just not right. We borrow the federal government 1.8%, and we're going to charge up to 8% to families. We're lending to the banks at 7.75%. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know how many speakers are left over there. I'll reserve. I'll reserve. Gentleman from Minnesota reserves. Gentleman from California. I uh, yield one minute to the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell. Gentleman from California is, is recognized for one minute. I rise in opposition, Mr. Speaker, to the Making College More Expensive Act. And how short are some of the memories of my friends on the other side, for it was market-based principles, unregulated market-based principles that led to the housing crisis that we are just now getting out of. And doubling the student loan rate is an attack on students, and the increased debt that they will take on will build a great wall around our middle class. There's no better way to have a healthy, growing middle class than access to education. Today, our middle class is shrinking. If you're in the middle class, 
you're making about $5,000 less than you were 10 years ago. If you're in the middle class, you have about $25,000 more in debt than you did 10 years ago. Doubling the rates will increase the debt that our middle class has. I know a thing or two about student loans. I have thousands of dollars of them myself. And this is not just dollars on interest rates. We are talking thousands of dollars that individual borrowers like myself and the people that grew up with me in a middle class town called Dublin will take on. Let's tear down this great wall that the GOP and the House leadership are trying to build around our middle class and let's not double the rates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By the gentleman from Minnesota. I'll continue reserve. Reserves, gentleman from California. I yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you. The gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for a minute and a half. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise in strong opposition to the Republican Making College More Expensive Act that we're considering today. Market-based systems will drive up the cost for millions of middle-class families, but will, of course, also benefit some of our biggest banks and other financial institutions. If we want to get our country back on the right track, put men and women back to work, and ensure that we remain competitive in the global economy, we have to do more to make higher education more accessible and more affordable, not more expensive. Without congressional action, the interest rate on federal subsidized Stafford loans is scheduled to increase from 3.4% to 6.8% for more than 7 million students. We should not be making a profit on student loans, period. We have proposals that will end this practice and give students access to college at the lowest cost possible. Unlike this bill, the Student Loan Relief Act, the Responsible Student Loan Solutions Act, and the Bank on Students Loan Fairness Act would each preserve low interest rates for students. But the bill before us today is a bad Republican idea that will make college more expensive for working families and will benefit some of America's largest financial institutions who will earn billions more in student loan interest. Hidden within this bill is a blatant bait-and-switch scheme that will allow students to borrow money at one rate before the interest rates skyrocket. Let's reject the Making College More Expensive Act and find a serious long-term solution on student loans that will make college more affordable for millions and millions of American students. Thank you, and I yield back the balance. Gentleman is back. Gentleman from Minnesota Reserve. Gentleman from California. I yield one minute to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks. Gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'm puzzled. This is not the America that I know. Can't be. When we were growing to make ourselves a great nation, we were talking about trying to make sure that our young people had a free education. I can't figure out what's going on here. So many Americans that are doing well now, when I talk to them about when they were going to school back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, it was a free education. And now we want to ask our young people, the ones that are going to be the middle class, the ones that are going to strengthen this country to, pick, to be more in debt than ever. How could we say to our students, when we're talking about financial literacy every place and trying to teach them how to be financially able, that you've got to take a bait and switch alone? Didn't we learn anything from this last financial crisis? What are homeowners doing now? They're all who had these uh, adjustable rate mortgages. All of them are running to make the adjustable rate mortgages fixed rate mortgages. And yet we take who we say are our precious resources, our children, to say that you've got to pay these, uh, these resources is ridiculous. Some are wealthy, expired. some are not. Gentleman from Minnesota. Reserve gentleman from California. I think I have no further speakers. Is the gentleman, the chairman, uh, the last speaker? I'm prepared to close, yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I want to thank all of my colleagues who, who entered into the debate here this morning uh, on this legislation. Uh, I think that it's clear there's a very, a very uh, big difference uh, between our positions uh, on this legislation. Uh, there's a very big difference between the president's bill uh, who is trying to use market, uh, a market system, and uh, this bill before us, Mr. Klein's bill, that uses a market system. The fact is the President's bill uh, saves students billions of dollars, but the Republicans would not make President Obama's bill for, in order for consideration. Why not? They say it's, just, it's, uh, it's like that they're doing the same thing as the President. Well, they're not. In fact, they're adding, on, they're adding $4 billion dollars worth of debt onto the back of students over their program. And how can they possibly do that? You've heard my, my colleagues on this side of the aisle 
speak to the issues that we hear all of the time when we go home. The struggle of students, the struggle of families, be they low income, be they middle income, to, pri to get access and to be able to complete a college education, to get access to a community college, to a state college system, to get a certificate, to get a degree uh, that will allow them to participate in the American society, in the American economy. That's the part of the American dream. Yes, we lowered the, the interest rates to 3.4 percent, and they've held over a period of years, and they held over those exact same years when families were under the most stress because of this recession that was created on Wall Street and the scandals that took away 70 percent of the wealth of African American and Hispanic families in this country, that destroyed the equity in good chunks of middle America because of teaser rate loans, subprime loans. And what's happening today in the private market? The banks are getting money from the Treasury at 0.75 interest. And they're loaning it to families in private student loans. And if, you're, if you have good credit, they'll loan it to you for somewhere around 7 percent. Bankers used to die and go to heaven if they could get a 7 percent spread. That's how you become a billionaire. Put it out, get it at 0.75, and put it out at 7. And if your credit rating is not so good, the, the statistics sort of suggest you drift toward 13 percent. Obviously, the students in middle class can't survive in that market for the most part. And that's why we have a student loan program. That's why we took this program away from the banks a number of years ago. We took the $60 billion that we were giving to the banks to loan the public's money to the students. And we said, why don't we put that to use for families? And we did. And we lowered the interest rates. And we, and we increased the participation in the Pell Grants, made it available. We increased some loan limits. We gave people a chance to manage the debt after they graduated. So they, the, the more you earn, the more you pay, but you don't get crushed when your first job that may not have the best salary, even though it's the career you want to go in and it takes time to get, to get that salary. We made it more affordable for America's families. Yes, we lowered the debt to 3.4 percent. It was paid for, and it's all we could afford. And first year Congresses will make that decision. Last year, the Congress made a decision to extend it. This year, they've decided that they don't want to extend it on the other side of the aisle. But what, so fine, come up with a plan. But the plan they came up with is worse than having, worse than having the 3.4 percent double on July 1st. How can you develop a plan that's worse for students? I mean, unless, I guess maybe if you go home and everybody in your district's working and everybody's participating in this slow growing economy that's getting better, I don't know, families I represent, they're still struggling. The recession hasn't left town, the recession hasn't left the country. You pick up the Wall Street Journal today and there's greater concern about what's happening in China, dragging down the world economy. There's greater concern about the Europeans dragging down the world economy. And America's trying to struggle. And their students are trying to struggle. And we're going to come along and more than double the rates. We're going to give them a teaser rate, though. This next September, the families go out and they get a rate probably somewhat lower than the current rate. But that loan will be adjusted and they don't know what those rates are going to be. And as long as they're in, as long as they're paying on that loan, that loan will continue to be adjusted. We just saw that history in America. We saw what that did. I don't have a problem going to a market system. How about a fair one? You know, the numbers, the president went to a market system. He point, he, for the subsidized staff loan, he said, he said on a market system, we'll go to 0.9. They said they'd go to, they'd go to uh, 2.5, 10 years plus 2.5. The president said 10 years plus 0.9. There's a lot of ways to go to a market system. You don't have to punish the American family. You don't have to punish the students in school to go to a market system. I wish the president had a cap. The gentleman has a cap. This could be worked out, but we don't do things bipartisanly anymore in the Congress of the United States. So because we can't get the president and the majority on the Education Labor Committee to sit down and work out the market system, because that's not allowed, we don't do bipartisan work, the victims are going to be the families and the students. 
and in the long term, our nation. Every member of Congress has come to this floor and said how important this education system is to our future economic growth, to competing in a globalized world, to have innovation, to have discovery, to have job creation. We're now creating a drag on job creation. We're now creating a, a, a drag on the opportunities for families. We're creating a drag on the ability to achieve the American dream. And a college education is part of that dream, but a college education is also critical to keeping this economy and this society moving. And, and with that, I'm very close to yielding back my time, I think. And I want to thank the chair for presiding. I would hope that my colleagues, whether they're committed to a market rate or not, would understand that this is a very flawed the gentleman's market time has rate. expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself the balance of our time. Well, Mr. Speaker, as always in these debates, there's a, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of misinformation. We're using it's that old thing about, uh, you know, figures lie and liars figure, and you've got uh, different guesses for interest rates and reports and all those sorts of things. And I want to get into some of that, but some of it's at the core of our, of our differences here. Let's get a couple of things straight. We've watched what's happened as Congress tries to chase an interest rate and get in political battles year after year. We remember that the 6.8% that was put in law was considered a good deal. And then there was the plan to take it from 6.8% to 3.4% for all loans. Didn't work. Costs a lot of money. Added to the debt, which is a problem that is still nagging us to this day. So, so interest rates were taken from 6.8 to 3.4 percent gradually over years, got down to the point where for one year the interest rate on subsidized Stafford loans, not the unsubsidized Stafford loans, not the plus loans, didn't have the money for that, took it down to 3.4 percent for one year and then there wasn't enough money. And so by law, the interest rates on those loans went back up to 6.8 percent. And last year, in election year, we had a big political fight, and that's what you can anticipate, apparently, forever, as politicians try to use this as a political pawn and fight over what the student loan interest rates ought to be and what can be afforded. And, and Mr. Speaker, what can be afforded counts. It counts. Because a problem, as I said, that has continued to nag us is we have a mountain of debt in this country. We've been running deficits year after year of over a trillion dollars. We've got over $16 trillion in debt. We have to face that issue here coming before us. And so while we would like all student loan interest rates are low and we want to get them as low as we can, we don't want to add to the mountain of debt that's out there. So, we thought that it would be a good idea to let the free market determine what those rates ought to be, and we came forward with a proposal, and we talked about our proposal with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, staff to staff, hour after hour, trying to beat this out, staff to staff, talking to the White House and the Department of Education about what we're doing and what they're doing and what might work out. I talked to the Secretary of Education before this bill was ever introduced, because I agreed I agreed with the President and the Secretary that we need a long-term solution and get out of kicking this can down the road with annual, or maybe it's semi-annual or biannual, political battles. And so we moved to the market. We used a 10-year Treasury that the White House was proposing using. Senate Republicans wanted to use a 10-year Treasury. And then we worked it, Mr. Speaker. We worked it and worked it to get as close to budget neutral as we could possibly get it. Because we want to help students. We want to give them certainty. And we want them not to rely on the whims of politicians here. And we want it also not to put a burden on the American people and the taxpayer and not add, not add to that debt. So we tried to get it close to zero. We've seen charts down here. I love charts, particularly colored charts, you know. We've seen charts down here that says that our bill, our bill is adding billions of dollars to student debt. Well, they've got a counterproposal over there. I think the gentleman from California offered it, the president's proposal. 
In President Obama's plan, that additional debt to students is $3.1 billion. Ours is 3.7 over 10 years. We tried to come together on this, and Mr. Speaker, I think we can continue to try to come together on this, and we need to move this forward. There are a lot of things we need to do to help students, and certainly one of them is to help graduates get to work. Half of all college graduates now are underemployed or unemployed, doing things, working in places, um, employing none of the skills that they learn in college. We need to get the economy going. We're still asking where are the jobs. We need to get Americans back to work. You can't get Americans back to work if you just keep piling on mountains and mountains and mountains of debt and piles of regulations. But that's a fight for another day. Income-based repayment systems, we didn't touch on our bill. There are some interesting proposals out there we want to look at. Right now, with this bill, we're just trying to determine who is going to set interest rates. Politicians here are the market. So here's what we heard from the other side today. Washington should be in charge of setting interest rates on student loans. Washington should be in the business of creating confusion and uncertainty for student loan borrowers. And Washington cannot agree to a long-term solution that will serve the best interests of students and taxpayers. I think we need to keep working to do that. It's pointed out that the Senate won't act. Well, for many of us in this body, that's not a lot of news. But July 1st is still July 1st, and there's an incentive over there, and I believe the Senate must take action, and I look forward to working with them to achieve the long-term solution that I think that, that we all need to see. It was pointed out that we have a variable rate, and the President has a variable rate, but then his fixes. Certainly under our law, when you graduate, if you're in a low-interest environment, you can consolidate those loans and fix them for the duration, ever how long you're taking to pay off those loans. If it's in a high interest rate, you may not want to do that. The other plan, you've already got a fixed rate. <clears throat> we believe we can work together. The only way we can continue to work together to solve this is to pass this legislation, pass it today, I urge my colleagues to reject the failed status quo and embrace a responsible long-term solution on behalf of students, families, and hardworking American taxpayers. I urge my colleagues to support the Smartest Solutions for Students Act, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields back. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 232, previous question is ordered on the bill as amended. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to amend the Higher Education Act of 1965 to establish interest rates for new loans made on or after July 1, 2013. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Arizona seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have a motion to recommit at the desk. Is the gentlewoman opposed to the bill? I am. The gentlewoman qualifies. The clerk will report the motion. Ms. Sinema of Arizona moves to recommit the bill, H.R. 1911, to the Committee on Education and the Workforce with instructions to report the same back to the House forthwith with the following amendment. Redesignate Section 3 as Section 4. Insert after Section 2 the following new section. Section 3, protecting students from the teaser interest rates that led to higher long-term cost. Nothing in this act shall be construed to, one, authorize a student or parent borrower to be charged a teaser interest rate that entices the borrower with an initially low interest rate that subsequently skyrockets, dramatically increasing the total amount of interest rate due on a federal student loan for the student. Two, authorize an increase in the total cost of post-secondary education for students. Three, authorize false advertising that hides Speaker. the true cost of any federal student loan to a student Clerk will Mr. Speaker, I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Clerk will continue. Three, authorize false advertising that hides the true cost of any federal student loan to a student or parent borrower, including possible interest rate increases from year to year. The total amount of interest that a borrower may owe on such loan and the number of years that a borrower may take to repay such loan or for. 
limit the authority of the Secretary of Education to include in any disclosure related to interest rates that a secretary is required to provide to a borrower for a loan made under Part D of the Higher Education Act of 1965, 20 U.S.C. 1087A, or at prior to the disbursement of such loan. A, an explanation that the applicable rate of interest for the loan is a variable interest rate and how such variable rate may affect the borrower's total cost of attending an institution of higher education, or B, estimations on the total amount of interest payments that a... Is there objection to dismissing the reading? There is no objection. The court will suspend. Uh, pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes in support of her motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. This is a final amendment to the bill and will not kill it or send it back to committee. I oppose H.R. 1911. While it's bad enough that student loan interest rates are set to double on July 1st, this bill actually...